She said, I'm going to dial up the density and the diffusion and increase the release time. Dial in a bit of that reverb and then find a good position. Hey everybody, Chris here with another Sonicware live in video. So after the success of the live and lo-fi 12 sampler, Sonicware are back with another sample place live in, this time in the form of a granular synthesizer called the Texture Lab. The Texture Lab can function as a granular synth and effects unit. We can sample our own sounds into the unit from the line in. We can layer the sample playback and grain playback. We can manipulate the grains using the front panel controls and also through the flexible modulation system. A shimmer reverb is included with lots of different types and then we've got the usual step sequencer, MIDI and sync in and out and different playback modes. It's a unit that's very well suited to audio experiments, large pad sounds and glitchy sounds. Unlike some of the previous loans, editing is possible without the use of an overlay so all controls are available from the front panel at all times. So we could record a sample from an external source like a synthesizer. and then scan through the sample to create large pad sounds. We could take a recording of a voice like this. Five. And then stretch that out to make a longer, more disturbing version of it. And then as an effects unit, we can use it to process our external gear. So we could take a sound like this. And then create our own modulation effects on the texture lab to process the audio like this. So you may be wondering, how does granular synthesis work? Well, this diagram from the manual does a pretty good job of explaining it. So the black section in the background represents our sample, or it could be audio input if we're using the effects mode. The blue section represents the part of the sample that we want to play back. And then from within that, grains are extracted, which are represented by the red sections. Grains are small sections of the sample that we can play back and manipulate. Typically, more than one of these grains will play back at once, and it's the way they overlay with each other and interact that makes granular synthesis interesting. So let's dive in and check out the Live and Texture Lab. So let's start where I often do on these tutorials and just check out the physical uh, layout of this. So uh, as with all the other livens, we've got 16 knobs, one of which is an encoder type and the rest have start and end points. We've got 16 rubber buttons below that, 16 step buttons and then 27 keys. We've got a power socket at the top left with a power switch below. We've got a display that's going to give us feedback on what we're editing. We've got sync in and out for connecting to Volkers and pocket operators that provides a sync via pulse. MIDI in and out, We've got line in and out so we can send audio through the line in to record samples into the texture lab. We've got a line out for connecting to our audio interface or something for recording and a headphone socket and then a built-in speaker. And on the back of the unit there is a battery compartment for six double eight. So generally the way it's laid out is that the knobs will be used to make edits to our sounds the rubber buttons uh, contain a transport control, a section for selecting different parts of a pattern, and then a few other functions. The step buttons for entering steps into a sequence, and then we can access some other functions by holding function and pressing those. And then the keys are for playing our notes, entering those into a sequence. And again, we can hold function to access some menus below. With the power supply connected or batteries in the back, we can hold power to turn the unit on. And the first thing that's going to load is the default pattern, which is pattern one in bank one. We can play that by pressing play. And play again to stop. You'll notice it's coming through the internal speaker. We can adjust the volume here. Uh, but for the rest of this video, I'm just going to plug a connection into the line out so that we get a nice clean recording. So now when you press play, 
You'll notice you're getting audio from the line out and from the speaker. We can mute that speaker if we want to. So we do that by holding function and pressing this key here. So when we press function, we're accessing uh, features that are written below the buttons. So uh, below the steps and below the keys. So if I hold function and press that, we're going to mute the speaker. Shift works in the same way, but when we hold shift, we access parameters that are written in lowercase letters below the knobs. So in this case, I'm changing the size. And then if I hold shift, I'll change the shape. We can use the shift lock too. If we want to play while we're changing that shape, for example, we can hold function, press shift. Shift lights up. So we're, we're changing the shape and then we can play the keys. If we want to clear that, we just press shift again. So next to the speaker mute, there's a headphone gain. So if you hold function and press this, that's going to change the volume just of the headphone output and not of the line out. With this on the screen, we can use the value knob to tweak this. So we've got soft, normal and loud. I'm going to change it up to loud. That would affect the relative volume of the headphone compared to the speaker and the line out, but nothing else. So now I can cycle back out of this by pressing this again and we're back to the pattern edit mode. So what you've been hearing is one of the patterns. A pattern contains all the uh, information about editing the sound as well as step information for notes. So not only can we press play and hear that, we can also play it on the keys down here. If we want to change the octave of the keys, that's where the octave buttons come in. So lower and higher, and they will change the different colors to represent which octave we're in. If you want to load a different pattern, we just press the pattern button that's here. And then we can either cycle through with a value knob showing different ones on the screen, or we can use a combination of the step buttons that picks different patterns. And these buttons here, these four buttons will cycle between banks two, three, and four. And if we press them twice, we get to banks five, six, and seven, and eight. So let's just put that back to bank one, pattern one. By default, bank one contains synthesis patterns and bank two contains some EFX patterns. If we want to as well, whilst one pattern is playing, we can select a new one and that first pattern will wait to finish before the next one starts. We can also double tap the pattern button to put it into pattern chain mode. And that will mean we can pick multiple patterns and they will play through it in order when we press play. I'm just going to cancel that to back out of here. You'll notice as well as we're playing, we can change the BPM. So pattern BPM is default. So the pattern will save its own BPM and this will load each time a pattern is loaded. So if we press play, we can change the BPM to a quite a wide range. There's also a global BPM. This will override pattern BPM. So you can play multiple patterns in a row and the BPM will remain constant. To get to this, we hold function and go to system. And the first selection is BPM. We can change between global and pattern. So, to, so now we've selected global. We can hold shift and that alters the BPM. I'm just going to put that back to pattern BPM. There's a number of other functions in the system menu, but I'll cover those a bit later. You'll also notice as well as we press, as we play, these buttons here change color. These are our page buttons for our pattern. So This pattern has eight pages. So if we press this one, make it turn red and these are green, that's pattern, that's page one, page two, page three, page four. And if we double tap them, page five, six, seven, and eight. This is linked to how long the pattern is, which is changed in the length down here. We'll come to that later. It's so one other function you probably need to be aware of earlier on, and that is the knob latch function that's here. Sometimes it may seem like the knobs aren't responding. That may be because this is turned on. So a good example is if you turn this tempo down and then reload that pattern. If knob latch was on, let's turn it on. As we press play, this will seem like it's not responding. That's because we need to pass it through the saved point before it latches on and continues to, to move that number. So there we go. Whereas if that knob latch is off, let's load that pattern back in again. That will make edits immediately. So for the rest of the tutorial, I'm going to leave knob latch off because it just makes tweaking the, the sounds easier, but it's a way to preserve your settings if you don't want to accidentally knock one of the knobs and change the settings completely.
So now if I wanted to clear that pattern, I could do that by holding clear and pressing pattern. And that'll ask me if I want to wipe everything, which will clear the notes and the sound. Uh, using the value nub to change it to note, we'll just clear the notes and keep the sound. And then changing it to sound, we'll clear the sound, but keep the notes. But let's do all, so that will return it to blank state. So we've got only one page, we've got nothing in the step sequencer. We've gone back to a default sound. But what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to pick a fresh pattern. So I'm going to press pattern. I'm going to cycle around to bank three and select this. So this should be empty for you. So again, we've got nothing in the sequence. So we've got one page and that default sound. So to begin with, I'm just going to change this blend knob. I'll explain it a bit later on, but I'm going to turn that all the way to the left and that will enable us to hear just the sample. The sample is loaded here, so um, we've got a sample selection slash line in knob. The, when it's in EFX mode, this becomes our input volume, but in the normal synthesis mode, this is just gonna choose a sample. So this is epic. We've got all these different samples to choose from, so that's what that's for. Like we said earlier, we can play on the keys. If we want the different notes that we play into our sequence to be of different volume, we can program velocity. And so velocity is here and it's tied to volume only. So if I go shift, uh, function and shift, and change this, the default setting is 100. Notes entered at a lower velocity will be quieter. Uh, this is a per note setting, so you can get uh, quite good fidelity in terms of different volumes per note. So if you want to enter some notes into the sequence, one of the easiest ways to do it is just to hold a step and press a key. So if we do that here, here, and here, and then press play, we're gonna get that. If we want to erase those, we press clear, and that's them now gone. Another way is to record in real time. So let's turn on the metronome. So that's this little thing here. So function metronome is now on, and then we need to turn the volume up. So metronome settings volume turn it up a little bit and we've got a beat that keeps in time with our tempo i'm also going to cycle around to pre-count this adds some beats before we start recording so let's turn that up to four and then when we press record and play it will count us in and then we can play something in so we can turn the metronome off when we're done with it there we go, it's gone. Like that. So I'm gonna show you the third way of recording, which is step mode. Uh, we can press record, we can choose a step, we can play a note in, and that will then be saved into that step. So if I just put a C in there, that is then saved there. If our tie function is on, which is here, that'll be lit up if it's on. So that's off and that's on. Um, ties are notes that are longer than one step we'll be able to pick a step, hold a note, and then press another step, and that will create a long note. Like that, so. It's difficult to hear the difference at the moment, so I'm gonna turn this release knob down. That is how long of a tail there is after the note finishes. So you can hear this is longer than this. One other function for the step record mode is the um, auto step. So if we go into system, cycle around to a step, let's turn that on. So if we press record, select a step, play a note, that will then move automatically to the next one. So this way we can create quick sequences without having to constantly move the step ourselves. So let's put a load more notes in after that. So we've got that A and then just go C. Some horrible sequence I've created. Just because I want to demonstrate the swing function, which is in here, so pattern settings. Swing changes the timing of um, even numbered steps. So they become further away from the odd numbered steps. It's an obvious thing to hear when you actually listen to it. So that will affect these here. If I dial up swing, between zero and 
Then also in our pattern settings, we have a transpose function. So if we go around to transpose, we can change the sequence saved uh, by in semitones. So we crank this up two semitones. The whole thing's gonna play higher and then we can go down as well. So that just changes everything. That makes it easier sometimes, just if you don't want to have to re-record something, you can just shift it around. If you want a sequence that's longer or shorter than 16 steps, we just need that length function that we mentioned earlier. So function length, and that will display the number of steps. Uh, at the moment, this is a one page sequence. If we bring that down, it's gonna shorten it, as we can see. And as we go up, we'll see it adds pages. Uh, so anything over 16 will add another page, anything over 32 will add another, and then we can go all the way up to 128 uh, steps on this sequence on the texture lab. So I'm gonna bring that back down to 16 and exit. Also in our pattern settings is our note setting. This changes the relative length of each one of these steps compared to our tempo. So if I turn the metronome back on again, sorry, there we go. Each one of these steps is currently 1 16th. If I change this note setting up, the sequence is going to play twice as fast. And I can turn it down. There's lots of triplet settings. So there's lots of different ways we can get higher and lower resolution recording that way. So while we've got a basic sequence recorded, I might as well have a look at the playback modes. So we've got a random and a stutter. So if we turn on the stutter mode, we can press a step in the sequence as it's playing and it will repeat that. So that's a good way we can get some variation in just by playing it in by hand. And then we've got the random feature. This is linked to the pattern settings. So if we turn on random and then we go into our uh, pattern settings and go around to random and turn this up to four, that will then pick groups of four notes and play them in a different random order each time. Whereas if I change it to two, it's going to pick groups of two. So that's a good way to get some generative stuff going. So now if we're happy with this sequence, we can save it. So we press function and the save is under the pattern button here. So function and save, and then we can choose what we want. I'm just going to save it into the same slot. So um, bank three, pattern one is selected, press OK, and then that's saved. So everything we've done so far has been running through the internal reverb. So if we play a key, you can hear that's that long tail that comes after the notes finished. If we want to turn that down, it's controlled from here. So the mix level, we were to hold shift and turn this, that will give us a dry signal. In the middle is a 50-50 mix and then right at the top, it's completely wet. And it's also a shimmer reverb, which adds an octave in above artificially. Uh, so if we turn that shimmer all the way down, we've got standard reverb, we turn shimmer up, we've got a mix of the original reverb and an octave above. And if we crank that right up, we've just got a really high sounding reverb. We've got different reverb types to choose from too. So function and reverb type here will get us there. So we've got lots of different ones, tunnel, infinity, hall, room, arena, and plate. These are all gonna have different sonic characteristics and different tail lengths. We can also add reverb to an external piece of equipment. So I've got the LZ1 set up here, just out of frame. And I've got this really basic uh, saw patch. It's just a kind of beep. And then, so we can control the line in from this menu here. So function and line in. The first entry we've got is gain. So that just controls the volume. So if I turn this down, we can control the, the volume that the audio is coming in. The line is really good in this regard for something like a drum machine that we can plug in and play uh, in sync whilst we're playing on the texture lab. The next entry in the line in menu is mono to stereo. Sorry, stereo to mono. So we can choose to change the stereo signal to a mono signal. It's off by default, so anything coming in at stereo will play at stereo the output. We can also add the line in to the reverb. So again, in the reverb here, we've got a line in setting, so it's off by default, and then we can crank it up. Or 
all the way up to max and then cycle back round to off. So again, that's useful if you wanted to run external gear through the same reverb as the synth engine. So part of the fun of granular synthesis is being able to use our own samples. And we can do that here because we can sample directly into the texture lab through the line in socket. So I've still got the LZ1 set up and I've created a, a filter sweep. So let's sample that in. We've got some sampling settings down here at the, at the bottom left menu. So function, record settings. There's an auto level. So the lower this is, the more keen it will be to automatically start recording when it hears audio. We can turn this all the way off, up to off if we want to manually hit record, but I'm just gonna leave that at the bottom. The next setting along is a record source. So you can switch from the line in to pattern. So if we want to resample a pattern, we can do that too. So I'll show that a bit later. So let's leave it on line in for now. And then I'm gonna go function and sampling, which is here. And then we can play and the LEDs will display how loud this signal is. Samples are automatically normalized after recording. So don't worry if it's a little bit weak, but you do want it to be fairly good. So we can hit record and then I can play and they've got a six second sampling time that uh, it's going to record this uh, port sweep. Okay, then we can just press okay. And it'll ask us which slot we want to save it to. Um, so as we go through, we can preview just the contents of these slots just to make sure there's nothing in there that we don't want to keep. So I'm just going to put it in number 18. I'm going to press OK and it's going to save it. So I'm on a fresh pattern now, which I loaded before I started recording. If I change this sample selection up to uh, sample 18, there's there's a sample we created earlier. Just so we don't forget where that is, I'm going to name it. So sample data down here. The first entry in that menu is sample naming. We can press OK. We can use the value encoder to change the on-screen letter and we can use the octave buttons to select which part of the name we're editing. We can turn these little dots on and off too. So I'm just gonna name that wow quickly. There we go. And then we press cancel to back out of there. And then as we go around, we'll be able to see that's now save that name. So if we were to resample one of the patterns that sounds like this, we can record that down into a fresh sample to rework and do all sorts of crazy stuff with we could make a chord and then record that down into a new sample and use that again. So I'm just going to change that input setting in the record settings here. So record source pattern, and then the procedure is the same. So record, um, we're going to press record again and it will wait for an audio signal. There we go. So and available as a sample. I'm not going to say that because I, I, I don't need it for the rest of the tutorial, but we could save that to a new sample as many times as we like. You can keep building uh, new samples that way. So now we've got that sample in, let's start to have a look at some of the sample and synthesis functions. I might hop backwards and forwards between different samples just to, because some of them are better at showing uh, some of the controls than others. Uh, but to begin with, let's just turn that reverb mix down. So we've got a nice dry signal. I'm going to back off that release as well. So the release knob will, like I say, create a tail. So the higher it's turned up, the longer it will take for the sample to stop playing. If we turn it all the way down, I'm just going to get in, in like an instant release. The release knob also incorporates what's called a gate time, so we can control how long each one of these steps is held on for. So I've just programmed in a row of, of notes here. So we can make these really short if we want to, using uh, the release at the lowest amount. And the attack is on the knob below, so if we've just shift and turn that up, that's the opposite. We get a a longer fade in before the volume kicks in. So, so as mentioned, the blend knob uh, mixes between the grain output and the sample output. So to begin with, I'm just gonna leave that at the bottom. So we've just got the sample output. We've got a pitch knob here that affects both the sample and the grain pitch. So we can turn it up and down. We've got the position and length. 
So the position and length determine which part of the sample plays back, but also which part of the sample the grains are extracted from. So if we turn that length down and scan through with the position, you can hear it's just playing a small section of that sample. Um, we've got a speed setting as well. This only changes the pitch of the sample playback, not the pitch of the grain playback, which is important later. But uh, there are positions where the sample and grain output can play back in octaves, so that's quite useful for creating a sort of sub oscillator with the sample and a higher part with the grains. If we want to trim a piece of the sample out completely, say there's a piece of noise or something in there that you don't want the sample playback engine to find at all, we can use the sample start and end trims. So if I press uh, function and end, it's currently set right to the end and we can trim that down with the value encoder. And then if we press function and start, that's the beginning of the sample. Again, we can trim that. We can also punch through in uh, increments of a thousand. I'm just gonna leave that right at the bottom. So let's change the sample. Um, I'm gonna pick test, which just counts through some numbers. One, two, three. Because it makes it easier to demonstrate this direction setting. So the left part of the display means the setting for the sample output, and the right part of the display means the setting for the grain output. So at the moment, both grain and samples will both play forward. If I change that to one of the other ones, I'm going to get a reverse playback of the sample. And then uh, we've also got some ping pong ones. So this goes forwards, backwards. One. Two. I'll just shorten that slightly. One, no, one, no, one, no. And then we've got uh, backwards, forwards. No, one, no, one. And some other things. So random, I think, just affects the grain output. So let's just leave that on forwards for now. So another setting related to sample playback is the position random settings here. So position has its own random LFO. So at the moment, one, two, it's not on. If we turn up the rate by holding shift and a bit of depth, that's going to randomize that position. So I can just So even with just those uh, quick little settings, we can get some really interesting stuff out of just the sample playback side of things. So I'm just going to change that sample back to WOW, because we're going to demonstrate the voice modes. At the moment, we can play chords. So multiple notes across the keyboard. But if we want to do that differently, we can go mode. And then we've got a mono one, which is going to um, interrupt the sample and start over each time. And then on the adjust part of the voice modes, we can change the glide time. So if we turn this up. We get a pitch slide between the two. And the next one along is legato, which is similar, but the sample won't restart. So, so it's going to keep playing and it won't get interrupted. And again, we've got a, a glide time that's separate. Like that. And the next one along is arpeggio. So this follows the tempo and the note setting. And also the gate part of the uh, release and gate knob here. Just gonna cycle back round to poly. A bit like around when we started looking at grains, the voice mode determines how many grains are available. So 16 grains per voice in poly mode 32 grains per voice in mono mode and 64 grains per voice in legato mode. So that quite drastically affects the, uh, the grain output. So let's move on to looking at grains. So inherently with granular synthesis, there will be some volume fluctuations. If grains stack directly on top of each other, they can boost each other's volume or if they fall out of phase, that can be reduced. Or if you're pulling grains off part of the sample that has no audio in it, obviously that's going to reduce the volume too. So there will be times where the volume goes up and down and I may need to just tweak it to make it right.
So I'm just going to turn the blend knob all the way to the right. I'm going to select that test sample again. One. But let's just go over this direction knob again. So the left hand side of the display not only determines which way the sample plays, but also which direction the grains are captured. And the right side of the display determines which direction the grains are played back. So that's forward capture, forward playback. If we change this to... Oh. The grains are being collected in the forward direction, and but they're being played back in reverse. We can do that with a random. One, two, three, four. Random uh, reproduction of those grains. Uh, we can capture them backwards and play them forwards. One. So this has a drastic effect on the output. I'm just going to leave it on. I think forwards random is quite a good one to demonstrate things with. Again, if we change it to wow. It's quite a smooth sample, so the changes aren't so obvious. But if we reduce the grain size. You can hear the effect that's having. So each of the tiny little bits that it's collecting are small. The density knob is going to determine how many of those grains are stacked on top of each other. So at the bottom, it's just going to be one. And as we turn it up, more grains will be overla overlaid. And at the top, it's going to add detune to those grains too. Which is not so obvious with a short size, so let's... There we go, we've got detune versus grains that are not detuned. The timing is going to determine how often those grains play back. So at the center setting, lush, they're going to be as tightly packed together as possible. Then either side of that, we can go for a manual timing or a sync timing. So we can create gaps between the grains and then we can do the same thing, but at, the, at a rate that's synced to the clock. Let's put that back on lush in the middle. And now the diffusion control on the right hand side will pan those grains left and right randomly. So we can create a lot of width. One, two, three, four, five, six, one. This also works well in combination with the density knob because we can get detune and panning width. Well, let's just turn those down again. So the jitter control adds randomness to the timing. So if we turn that up and select one of the uh, synced grain timings, for example, you can hear that's at slightly irregular intervals instead of just nicely on the beat. Our shape control determines how sharp the edges of the grains are. So at zero, we're just going to get square edges. So those grains will start and stop instantly, whereas if we turn the shape knob up, the start and end are going to be smoothed out on those grains. So as I mentioned before, the speed knob is going to determine how quickly those grains are collected. So if we go back to our test and just turn that direction back to one, two, three, here we can turn the speed down. One, two, three, four. And the grains are then collected at a slower speed, but still play back uh, at the original pitch. One, two, three. Or we can turn it up. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One. So that leads to some really interesting effects. The granular side has some randomization available as well. We've got grain random size and shape here. So we can randomize the size by turning this up. So we use the function and size and then dial up the encoder. One, two, three, four, five. That adds randomness to size. Let's just turn that off. And then we can add randomness to shape from this control. One, two, one, two, three, four, 
five. So randomly, it can be a, a mixture of those smooth and square shapes that we talked about before. So all this may seem a little bit overwhelming, but don't worry, it's more or less a case of experimenting with all the controls on the sample and granular side, depending on your source material, because you're going to get different results each time. It's much more a case of finding the sounds than designing them from scratch. But with that in mind, here's one I was playing around with and found earlier. So if we change that sample to word, which is just me singing a series of words all on the same note. She said put down the gun. And then dial the length down. Switch over to the granular side. She said. I'm going to turn the size to about the middle and then turn the shape up a bit. She I'm going to alter that timing up to lush. I'm going to dial up the density and the diffusion and increase the release time dial in a bit of that reverb and then find a good position so they're from me just singing a single word we've managed to capture a section and use granular synthesis to turn that into a big vocal choral pad sound so let's talk about the filter and some uh, modulation assignments so i've selected a different sound that's a good bit brighter so we can hear what the filter's doing and we need to turn our filter on because the cutoff at the moment won't do anything so our filter selection is made here so function and filter the first one is a low pass filter that removes high frequencies. And that sounds like that. We turn up the uh, resonance, which is at the bottom here, that gives it a bit more emphasis. I'm going to turn that down to about 20. So our next filter uh, type is a high pass filter that removes low frequencies. And then the bandpass filter just sweeps across a, a peak. So let's put that back to low pass. So unlike some of the other livens, there isn't a dedicated envelope for the filter, but we can use the modulation to control it. Not only can it do LFO shapes, it can also follow the key bed. And there's a couple of selections that enable us to use it like a mini envelope. So modulation one and two are identical, apart from modulation one has a fade in. So we can start a modulation at minimum and it will fade into maximum over time. So let's send mod one to the filter. So I'm going to go function and assign. And we've got lots of different assignments in here. We can send it to most of the things within the granular and sample side. So size, time, density, uh, diffusion, pitch position, length, speed and shape, jitter, the filter cutoff, which is what we want, filter resonance and the blend. So those are all targets that we can access with the LFO, or modulation, I should say. So let's send it to filter cutoff. We can change the shape from here. So there's loads of different shapes. Um, as you go down from the from the middle, we, we've got key follow and step plus and minus, which are the shapes we can use to make envelopes. Well, let's pick a triangle. So it's still not been sent anywhere just yet because we need to turn up the rate and depth. So the rate and depth for mod one are available from here. So let's turn up depth and rate. So that's how we send an LFO to the cutoff. If we wanted to change that to an envelope, like we were saying earlier, we need to go around to the, the plus shape. So the step shapes are a little unusual. The rate turns into a delay. So um, if we turn this rate to the middle and then the uh, depth up, I'm going to leave that cut off at the bottom. You can hear there's a delay there. So the lower it is, the longer it takes to come in. So I'm just going to turn that all the way up to the top. So this is going to act immediately. And then I'm going to change this fade in. So the longer the fade in time, the more time it takes for that to kick in. So we can use it in combination with the delay and that fade in to create some interesting modulation shapes. And also uh, the we have step minus. 
So that's the same, but in reverse, so we can lower this cutoff over time. So the settings for modulation two are identical, apart from we're missing that fade in, and the, uh, the rate and depth are set from here. We also have a mod sync setting. So when this is on, on all the rates, instead of seeing zero to one, two, seven, we're gonna see timing divisions. So uh, from four bars to a bar, up to a quarter note through up to one thirty second. So we can get synced modulation that way. So just like with all the other live ones, we have parameter lock recording. This means we can record the position of a knob over time, or we can program them in individually. So I've just played a very, very quick sequence in here, which is just that one sample of me singing, uh, just spread across this whole uh, pattern. She said, put down the gun, she said. So if I wanted to change the position of where that sample's being picked up over time, I could record that. So if we go function and into parameter lock, we're gonna get into parameter lock recording mode. And then as we play the sequence, we can move a knob and it will remember that. She said, So that has recorded the position of that knob on a per step basis. If we decide we don't want to keep that, we can just clear that recording. So now when we play back, that will just be as it was before. If I cycle around and make this green again, if I wanted the knob to move just in certain places, I can program it in by hand. So if I just hold this and hold a step and turn the knob, then only these steps will be affected. She said, she said, put, she said, she said, put. So you can dial in very precise amounts by using the parameter lock system. If we want to turn the parameter lock off temporarily, we can just press it until it extinguishes and then the parameter locks will no longer take effect. She said, put down the gun. So not only can we use the texture lab as a synthesizer, we can also use it as a granular effects unit and we can design our own granular effects. So I've got the sample track set up here. If I go into EFX mode, this sample source is essentially replaced by the line in. There are a few things that are different, but it's almost all the same. So this knob now affects the incoming volume level. And we're currently set to um, here the clean source. If we turn it over to the, the uh, grain side, we can do some crazy stuff. We can affect the pitch in real time on the grain side. And we can even do this with the keyboard and sequence those notes. Although it might be a good idea if everything's synced up properly if you were to do that. So the EFX mode records the keyboard playing monophonically. So we've got a glide that we can turn on and off on the voice mode and the glider just here. So the glider just will adjust how long it takes to sweep between those notes. And we can just turn it off if we want to. Like I said, there are a few things that are different. We don't have the attack and release because the audio is coming in constantly. Also, we can't control the speed of the incoming audio, so that's not available. But almost everything else is. We can route the modulation to different parameters and control the filter, run it through the reverb. So there's a hell of a lot of stuff we can do to get really great, strange modulation effects going. One function that's really useful in the FX mode is the freeze button. So that just freezes that incoming uh, audio sample and just uses that section alone. And it can be held in position by holding uh, OK and pressing freeze. So there's just a few things I need to tidy up that I didn't talk about. So if we go function and pattern level here, we can set the level of the overall pattern, which will be saved. So it's a good way to make sure they're kind of match in volume. We have undo and redo functions here. This is for undoing and redoing real time recording of notes and parameter locks. We have a clock setting here. So that determines the tempo. 
So by default it's set to internal, we can go with MIDI or the sync inputs, and we've got a line in which is, com is compatible with pocket operator style uh, audio and line in. And we also have uh, the same for the audio out, so we can send a pulse from the audio out. These are to do with uh, the polarity. Some of this information is best off reference to the manual, so I won't cover everything in detail. So we've got lots of things for MIDI about receiving and transmitting different channels, uh, transmission of the clock on and off, transmission of CCs, which is to do with the uh, knob movements. Yeah, so some of this stuff again, like I say, best off looks up in the manual. We have sample and pattern data menus here. So we named a sample earlier on, but we can also export the MIDI SysX for a sample and import MIDI SysX. And we've got the same for the pattern. So we can name a pattern, export a pattern as MIDI and, and import it automatically. We'll just receive it. You don't have to go into a menu for that. So in the system menu, we talked about BPM earlier. It's, we can also choose the, the way that the pattern chain works. So if we, if we chain put those four patterns together like we did right at the start of the video, with loop on, it'll just cycle over and over. We can just set it to off, it'll get to pattern four and just keep going. It's a bit of a legacy thing because that's how it used to work on the other livens. So that's auto step for a step recording. We can tune the whole unit from here. So there's a reverb reset function. So currently when this is on, as we transition between different patterns, the, the signal that's going through the reverb will re be reset. If we want that to be more smooth, we can turn the reverb reset off and make sure that the patterns have the same type of reverb and it would be a much smoother transition but from one pattern to another. We can change the battery type here. So if you're using rechargeables, you really need to select the correct type, otherwise the device might think that the battery is running out before they are, because they will have slightly different voltages. And then we have an auto power function, so I've got this turned off. But if you want yours to switch off after a certain length of time, you can dial that in here. And then we're back to the line in. I think we've covered everything now. So that seems to be everything. <laughs> There's been quite a mammoth one. So I really hope that's helped. I will be covering some of this stuff in more detail in the future, no doubt. But please let me know in the comments below if there's anything that didn't come across that well. And I'll try and cover it in more detail in the future. So thanks very much for watching. Please like and subscribe and I'll see you soon. Cheers.